A very good evening to you. Thank you for coming in. Let's begin then with your assessment of leadership in South Africa from the political mm. to the private sector. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Um, I think the assessment is pretty dire at the moment. We still have essentially the founding fathers of our democracies leading the political charge and no sense of renewal, either in the private sector or the public sector. And when I talk about renewal, I don't necessarily mean from an age perspective, but from a sense of, you know, in order to future-proof an organization, you have to do succession planning, you have to train the next generation of ethical leaders. That doesn't seem to be happening either in the public or the private sector. There's sort of a, a group of older dons who run both uh, sectors, and it's something that needs fundamentally to change. And with that change will come the diversity, the fresh ideas necessary to make our politics and our private sector more ethical. The obvious question becomes, why is that change not taking place? Well, people are gatekeepers. Um, in politics, we like to talk about how the politics of the stomach makes existing leaders gatekeepers to prevent newcomers from other sectors, like social justice and the private sector, from coming into politics. Um, and I also think that over time South Africa, because of the inequality in our country, has become a little bit of an oligopoly. Many of our sectors in the private sector are run by four or five big companies. We know whether it's banking or mining or others. It's very hard for small businesses, small entrants, new political parties, startups essentially to make their way into a system that's become dominated by big powerful interests. There's a few interesting green shoots here and there, um, but they're not always ethical, right? I mean, we can talk about the economic freedom fighters who've injected a huge amount of youth into politics have they injected ethics that's another debate and we'll talk let's talk about ethics mm -hmm. and how often it's seen as being made to suffer at the expense of the bread and butter issues do you think ethics are a big enough priority for the ordinary South African at a time when people just want a job, people just want to know that they are safe mm -hmm. and the very basic day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah, I think ethics is a big word for, well, it's a small word for a big concept. I think we always draw the line in the sand around, did this person break the law? Uh, and often you have politicians standing up in parliament and say, saying, what law did I break? But I think having ethical leaders is having leaders who say what they mean and mean what they say, who live the lifestyle that they claim to be support, supporting. If you support the poor and the unemployed, you live with them, you feel their pain. Um, leaders who don't speak with a forked tongue, who um, really represent the kind of country they want to live in, as opposed to speaking one way and acting another. And so I think we need to broaden our definition of what ethical leadership means and where we expect to find it. Because I think the other challenge we have, one of the reasons we have big dons managing, running leadership in the public and private sector is because no one outside of those two sectors holds them adequately to account or puts themselves forward as an alternative. I mean, that's why we set up this academy. We want to give people who want to replace this current generation of leaders an opportunity to look deep inside and prepare themselves for the task of leading this country. But how do young people in particular then begin to hold a cut to account a system that they, to some extent, feel as though they need to appease in order to be allowed a foot in the door? Because no. as you were saying earlier, you've got mm. all these gatekeepers and mm. you're often told that if you don't speak the right language, if you don't look the other way in certain instances, you will essentially make career limiting moves. The only way for young people to participate is to get involved. No one's going to give them an invitation. No one's going to welcome them into the fold and say, OK, I'm comfortable being replaced. They've got to fight elections, contest positions, challenge people who appear to be elders, but who are actually going on the wrong path. And frankly, start new political parties, run as independent candidates, uh, infiltra infiltrate independent institutions that are becoming rotten because they've been so deeply politicized and themselves show themselves to be the next sort of generation of good leaders. I think the mistake we make is A, telling young people that they're leaders of tomorrow, they're not, they're the leaders of today, and B, telling older leaders you need to make way for the next generation. That's not how politics works. Politics is about contestation, it's a bit of a street fight, and so we have to prepare this next generation of people, ethical uh, leaders who want to lead the people uh, with a sense of purpose rather than to feed themselves. We must teach them how to be politically savvy, how to get into the arena and how to contest for positions in an ethical, honest way um, so that they can get the power they need to make this country better. On the politics then, the biggest politics story at the moment is 
the ongoing questions around President Cyril Ramaphosa and the ANC presidential campaign funding in 2017. We've got mm. these leaked emails which go against his earlier statement that he was not aware or actively involved at least in fundraising efforts for that campaign. Mm. His spokesperson Kusala Diko coming on to ENCA earlier saying, in fact, yes, despite what these emails appear to show, there has been no lie, no wrongdoing by the president. Do you think Cyril Ramaphosa has carried himself, conducted himself in the best ethical way befitting of a president? I think President Ramaphosa, like many leaders before him, has carried himse himself in a way that is uh, concomitant with the law. And for many leaders in politics, the law is enough of a measure. There isn't a further measure, which is that if every email in my inbox ended up on the front page of the Sunday Times, would I feel comfortable with it? So, look, I think... I'm, I'm interested to hear what the outcome of the investigation will be. I think it's devastating that it requires half a billion rands to contest an internal election in our country today. That's something that we need to infiltrate, think about, talk about. Um, but I can't pronounce on, in terms of his conduct, whether or not he should be sanctioned in one way or another. I'm interested to see how the process will unfold. But I do think President Ramaphosa and other leaders like him have a duty in our country to measure themselves in terms of ethics by more than just the standard of the law. So even if you haven't necessarily broken the law, is this something that you can look your constituents in the eye and say, you know what, um, you know, having to spend half a billion rand on an internal campaign that no one in the public sees is something I'm super comfortable with. I I'm not sure that's the kind of... Has he handled these questions then in the best way possible? What's your assessment? No, I mean, I think it's fair to say that if you're the campaign leader, if you're the head of a campaign, you have a duty to know every single penny that's coming into your campaign and to be able to account for it. I act, on a personal level, I happen to believe him when he says he did not know about Busasa. He did come clean in Parliament and say very clearly, um, I thought it, I hadn't received this funding it turns out that I have I've given it back I think that's true but I also don't think it's enough I think especially when you are the cleanup president you kind of have a duty to be beyond reproach and look none of us is a deputy Jesus right we all make mistakes but I think as a campaign head as the person who's the face of a campaign when stuff like this comes out you've got to be able to stand by your decisions one way or the other quick one then um, there's the big issue of the unemployment rate, which continue, continues to rise, it's above 29%. We had just on a few minutes ago the small business minister who was saying, you know, there is a plan to try and get the small business people more involved in the economy, formalizing informal traders and that sort of thing. Do you think that South Africa has a clear enough strategy to be able to bring that number down in the immediate term? So I was a really big fan of the stimulus package that came out during the president's campaign period where he spoke about everything from um, reform to immigration law to infrastructure development, getting our infrastructure spending up to the correct percentage of GDP, I think it's about 5%, and stimulating the economy in ways that will bring in investment and create the jobs necessary to improve people's lives. I'm not sure that post election those things are happening at quite the speed they should but I also don't think we should underestimate the rot that took place under the Zuma administration I often liken this situation that we find ourselves in to how the ANC found South Africa coffers empty after the apartheid government vacated right believing it was one way but finding out that in fact the looting had been so rigorous and meticulous especially in the run-up to the election um, that the system had to be rebuilt from scratch so I think there are great people in government who can rebuild our institutions but I think fundamentally that ethos of having a stimulus package, a series of interventions that are short and medium term um, and that will stimulate confidence and inspire both domestic and foreign investment are key to bringing down the unemployment rate. Okay, so rate. with that in mind then, because we are running out of time, mm. is an economic or jobs revolution what is going to turn things around? Is that what we need, young people on the streets? Well, jobs revolutions don't happen by magic. They happen as a consequence of people bringing money into a country, building factories or building manufacturing centers that require intensive labor. And there's great opportunities that could be coming into South Africa from places like East Asia, where wages are going up, where we can absorb some of the low-skilled workers um, who haven't been adequately educated in our system, but who desperately need to get onto the formal economic ladder. But that requires, for investors from the outside, a government that signals um, that it's going to have stable policy framework, that it's going to invest in education,
that it's going to reform immigration so that skilled people can come and fill those over a million skilled vacancies, all the things necessary to stimulate the economy, and that infrastructure will be invested in. The lights will stay on, water will come out of taps. You know, Many of the job losses we've seen have been in municipalities where water isn't coming out of the taps. So we have a fundamental infrastructure challenge as well to face. So I think it's not enough for us to come out in the streets and march. I mean, and this is the thing about young leadership. You don't go out and ask for things. You go into the system and you are the change that you want to see. It's not enough to march and protest and complain. The young people, especially those with skills and the ability to change the system, need to get into it and make it the system they want to see. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you.